Welcome to the Become Your Own Therapist podcast. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, today's guest on the podcast is Professor Ian Parker. Uh, Professor Ian Parker is a practicing psychoanalyst in Manchester and a revolutionary Marxist. He is co-founder of the Discourse Unit Research Group, Secretary of Manchester Psychoanalytic Matrix and Honorary Secretary of the College of Psychoanalysts in the UK. He's a member of the new revolutionary organization, Anti-Capitalist Resistance, and of the fourth uh, international. His academic work has always been critical of psychology and psychiatry. His most recent book, co-authored with his Mexican comrade David Pavan Chula, is Psychoanalysis and Revolution, Critical Psychology for Liberation Movements. Um, so, Professor Ian Parker, thank you so much for being here. Hi. Great. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to have this uh, discussion with you, this uh, this idea of what it would mean to become your own therapist, because um, as you know, my podcast is is about exploring this topic with professionals to see uh, to what degree people are able to alleviate their own suffering um, and create a life worth living without necessitating the standard psychotherapy format. Um, I know you have critical ideas about psychology and the profession of psychology. So um, I'd, I think maybe for the listeners, it might be useful to just explain um, uh, critical psychology to them um, and uh, yeah, what your work primarily focuses on. It's okay. Uh, well, critical psychology is a way of turning back the gaze of psychology so that instead of the psychologists looking at people outside who are not psychologists, it turns the gaze back around psychology itself. So we look at the psychologists. We look at what the psychologists are doing and the way that they understand the world. And one of the things that we learn is that psychologists have a very limited understanding of what the world is and what people's real experience is. And so that's why the theme of your podcast is so important, uh, that people have uh, an experience, they're experts on their own experience, and we need to find ways of honouring that and building on that. Hmm. Great. Yeah. So I... Uh, what do you think the public? Um, what do you think the bu public can benefit from uh, the perspective on critical psychology? Is is there something in critical psychology that is important for the the non psychologist as well to know, and why so? I think the most important lesson is to do something different from psychology. Uh, um, most of the time, I don't call myself a critical psychologist. I call myself an anti psychologist. Because part of the problem is that psychologists like to seek accreditation and to become the experts. And then they imagine that they know more about psychology, everyday psychology, than anyone else. Uh, I think we've got to kind of show how psychologists, especially those working in academic systems, become disconnected from reality. And they develop some rather strange ideas about what everyday psychology is. So we've got to work in a quite different way to look at how people understand themselves and to build on their own experience, which is very, very diverse. I think the other lesson is that we can't say anything specific about how human beings in general are, but we've got to look at different contexts, different class relations, gender, sexuality, and so on, in order to understand the quite specific singular ways that people construct their own psychologies, build their own psychologies, experience the world in their own particular way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th I think that's that's so beautifully said. Um, and I, I, but what you're saying points to uh, such an important link uh, to context, uh, this, what's going on in the social environment and, and its interaction with what's going on inside the person and, and their own, uh, you know, maybe that distinction between the internal and external isn't... Uh, as rigid as I'm making it seem, but I, I was wondering for the for the listener who's listening to this and thinking, okay, so psychology, you know, uh, 
there, there, there's some danger in just buying into the the knowledge that psychology uh, you know produces uh, what would you uh, say to a person like that who's who might be feeling a bit uh, directionless as to okay so if I if the psychology is uh, you know uh, if, if there's a danger in following it wholeheartedly uh, where should I look to to alleviate my own suffering and the, the things that I struggle with I think the most important thing is to build networks of support so that you don't need an expert to tell you how to live your life. And those networks of support might be through religious organizations, they might be through community organizations, they might be in political groups. The key is to find something where you have something in common with other people and you can organize yourself in a way where your experience is respected and valued and where you have an input into that activity. Often we hear from psychiatrists <laughs> that you should take more exercise and get out more. And there's some truth in that. Uh, but what they have in mind is people behaving as good citizens and fitting in. Uh, rather, I think we need to think about how we can work together with people that we trust in order to challenge the oppressive systems of rule that uh, put us, that make us miserable in the first place. You know, the ways in which women are demeaned, people from different uh, cultural groups are demeaned and derogated, that we need to find ways of challenging that because I think it's only in that process of reflecting on the malign messages that we're given about who we are and working together to challenge those messages that we can actually start to feel as active agents in the world. Mm -hmm. I I've, I've have um, two questions there. I'll start with the first one. Um, and uh, I guess it's just to flesh out what you're saying, but uh, what is the danger of only taking that psychiatric perspective of you know, if I am struggling with this, then I need to go and exercise more, or do this or that to, to solve my own sort of internal suffering without looking to these broader networks. What's the danger in that? The danger is that you become even more isolated in yourself um, and that you start to believe other things that the psychiatrist tells you about how you should live your life. So uh, I think the task is to disconnect yourself from those experts, those so-called experts, and to find other ways of living. Now, there are critical psychologists and there are critical psychiatrists, and there are some very good psychotherapists as well. But uh, we need to, you need to find other ways of reflecting on what has happened in those encounters with them in order to decide which bits of advice you want to take seriously and which, which you want to uh, take with a pinch of salt. Mm. Yeah, I, I see. Um, I, I, isolation and, and alienation comes through a lot there in that, that first part that you you spoke about um wh how is there a way to to uh, lean on what these uh, you know so-called experts say about mental health and the adv the advice they give the methods they use is there a way to delve into that stuff uh without uh, necessarily isolating and, and alienating ourselves i think the problem is that the theories in psychology are actually taken from everyday life and are then turned into a kind of bizarre jargon and a alienated, isolated way of describing social relationships. Then the kind of studies that psychologists do are already disconnected from the world and the results of those studies then have very little connection with the real world itself. So, you know, it's a tough message in a society that is becoming all the more psychologized. That is, psychology becomes more and more a reference point for people in their explanations 
for their behavior, it becomes more and more difficult. It's a tough message, but we really need to disconnect ourselves from psychology if we're going to go forward. Uh, I think most of it can be dumped. <laughs> most of it can be ditched completely, altogether. <laughs> Great. I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd love to um, hear a bit more about the, the dangers and the problems with it, but uh, I'm actually, I'll, I'll shift focus just for this moment uh, to the, it, it, most of it sounds like there's, there's, some, there's some part of uh, psychology that from your perspective um, has value. And I was, I was wondering uh, what some of those things might be. Well, uh, th there sometimes in our psychology courses, we learn about psychoanalysis as being as some strange ideas that this guy in Vienna, Sigmund Freud, had back in the uh, late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Um, and those ideas from psychoanalysis are sometimes treated as a kind of subset of psychology, but we just learn them as kind of historical, peculiar ideas. Mm -hmm. It's like most psychologists are dead, but Freud is more dead than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, one of the strange things about psychoanalysis is that it's not psychology at all. Most of mm -hmm. the psychoanalysts in Central Europe before the Second World War, that is before the Nazis took power, most of the psychoanalysts were involved in socialist movements or communist movements. And when the Nazis took power, the psychoanalysts fled from Central Europe and went to different places, including to South Africa, actually. Mm. And they were in a precarious position and they shifted their position in order to stay safe. They shifted their position. Instead of challenging society, they encouraged people to adapt to society. So what I do uh, in my book with my comrade David Pavon Coyal, the Mexican revolutionary and psychoanalytic writer, what we do is we show that that history is really important that there's a radical history in psychoanalysis which offers something very different from psychology. Now, some psychoanalysts and some people using Freud's ideas still work as psychologists. So there's a very complicated work we have to do of disentangling psychoanalysis from psychology and showing how different it can be if we're going to make it into something radical. Mm -hmm. For the people listening, um, in what, oh, this radical form of psychoanalysis, um, not the one that's been uh, hijacked by psychology, you could say, um, what, uh, what is the message uh, in that form of um, psychoanalysis about uh, what human beings need to ease their own suffering and uh, empower themselves? I think a message is, a key message, is that there's something beyond us as human beings, mm -hmm. beyond what we are as individual isolated selves, that we are a network of social relationships and that we learn from those as we grow up in a family or grow up in any place. We learn from those relationships and kind of patch together images of who we are from our images of other people. So we are social beings. Freud himself said that every is a social psychology. And so we have to think about the social context for every form of distress. Everything we experience is social. And we can't grasp it all at once, but we can kind of navigate it, find our way around it by talking, talking to someone else and doing some kind of analysis of how we've come to be who we are and questioning that in order to find a different way of living, a different way of relating to others. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose a, another aspect 
of psychoanalysis that goes alongside that is that we keep repeating those past relationships that were so important to us. And so psychoanalysis is a way of reflecting on how we repeat those past relationships and how we might do something different. I think those are the key issues that, that we've got to take seriously. Mm-hmm. Now, apart from psychoanalysis being absorbed as a kind of psychology, treated as an individual psychology. Mm -hmm. Another problem is that a lot of psychoanalysis takes place as a private treatment that people have to pay for. And so we need to go back into history again, and we discover that before the Nazis took power in Germany and Austria and Hungary, that psychoanalysis was available as a free treatment. It was available as a free treatment, and Freud himself, Sigmund Freud, in 1918, gave a speech in Budapest in Hungary, where he said that psychoanalysis should be available free as part of welfare provision by the state. And at that time, in Hungary, there was a revolutionary process going on where it looked as if that might be possible, but the revolution was beaten back um, and, uh, and, and, and things changed. The possibilities were closed down. But since then, many psychoanalysts in different parts of the world have been doing some interesting work in communities where they don't work as private practice. Uh, people charging money, but they work with communities, and it's that kind of psychoanalysis which is connected with social processes that that we're trying to talk about, to describe in our in our book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I think that work is is really uh, amazing. I remember reading a bit about uh, community psychology, which is quite big here, actually, in in South Africa because of. Uh, you know, just just the uh, dif- uh, differences in wealth and the divisions, our history of division based on race, uh, and the lack of resources here in terms of psychologists. So, uh, b- but uh, your new book um, also elucidates what sci- uh, psychoanalysis could look like in that community context. And and so I was wondering if you could share a bit, um, you know, about that uh, the kind of work you're doing uh, based on that book, and just also practically with with the audience. Well, one example is uh, in Brazil, where psychoanalysis is very popular, and there's lots of discussion of psychoanalysis, where there are radical psychoanalysts who go into the favelas, go into the communities, and open a space for people to come and speak to them. It doesn't have to be in a clinic, they're not wearing white coats or anything like that, but they're just opening a space for people to speak about their experiences, including experiences of state oppression, experiences of racism, experiences of abuse in their families, and to be able to reflect on that and to find different ways of creating relationships that are more helpful, that are more empowering. Another example is there's a marvelous book by Lara and Stephen Shihai uh, called Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, which has just been published by Routledge, which is about psychoanalysts in Palestine working in communities and finding a way of developing a collective strength of the Palestinian people to resist Israeli state oppression. It's very, very interesting examples of uh, progressive work. And I do know that in South Africa, before the fall of apartheid, many psychologists stopped working as psychologists and instead worked in the context of a group called OASA, Organization of Appropriate Social Services in South Africa. That is, it was more important for them to abandon psychology, give up on the psychology, and instead 
go into community organizations mm. to help them develop their own strengths. And that included some therapeutic work uh, to help them make sense of the distress and trauma that they felt as a re result of the violence under apartheid. So mm. the ways in which psychoanalysis can be put into practice does vary from context to context. We need to take into account what is happening in the communities. Um, but there are lots of very important lessons that we can learn about the potential of psychoanalysis as uh, as a kind of liberation psychology. Let's, it's, let's put it that way. Instead of a psychology that tells people how they should should fit into society, psychoanalysis is a psychology which is concerned with liberating people, including liberating them from psychology itself. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but I'd actually like to hear a bit more about, um, well, I'd, I'd like to hear both sides. Firstly, uh, what are the ways in which, uh, just to make it clear for the audience, what are the ways in which psychology is, is focused on putting us in boxes? Um, and and classifying and and separating us, um, and then we can discuss um, the liberation. I'd like to discuss liberation psychology and and what that entails and how that contrasts this other thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, psychology starts by categorizing people. It starts by labeling people and treating them as collection of different separate identities. Uh, so you might be a man, you might be from a particular cultural community, uh, you, you then, the psychologist tells you have a certain kind of personality because of your childhood development. And so you become more and more restricted and constrained within the kinds of person that the psychologist understands. I can give you an example of this uh, mm. from Britain, where there's been some interesting discussions of what is called transcultural psychiatry and transcultural psychology, where practitioners are taught how to identify the particular kinds of pathology or the particular kinds of distress that are experienced in different communities. Mm. Now, this is a a good idea, but the problem is that these psychiatrists and psychologists learn about the different cultures, and then they expect people from the different cultures to talk about their experience in a certain kind of way. That is, they're trapped within the categories of psychology and psychiatry. Mm. And so if someone doesn't experience their lives in the way that the transcultural psychologist expects them to do, they can be kind of doubly pathologized. They're not meeting the standards that have been set by this model. Uh, and we know that every community, every community consists of various different fractions and divisions around class and gender and sexuality, ability and so on. And so we really need to go to each singular case, each separate individual, each person's experience, if we're going to go anywhere, rather than give general characterizations and come up with categories of person. We need to start in a different way if we're going to do anything progressive. Mm -hmm. So would, would you say the, the same about traditional uh, diagnostic uh, categories in the DSM and the, the ICD, that they are, they're, they're too general? They're at the, yeah, they're just too general. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the strange history of the DSM uh, is that once upon a time, when it, when it was first developed, uh, it consisted of very few categories, and it included some of the old psychoanalytic categories like hysteria and obsessional neurosis. Well, those have disappeared now. Um, I'm not sure it's a good thing. Maybe it is a good thing. Maybe we need to uh, be, think critically about those categories as well. But what's happened over the years is that the DSM has expanded so that the number of categories 
spirals out of control to try and capture the variety of ways that people live their lives. So you can be one of a number of thousands of categories that are there in the DSM. And you can imagine that the poor psychiatrist, if you just feel sorry for the psychiatrists for a moment, that the poor psychiatrist has to wade through this DSM in order to try and work out who you are and, and like, uh, if you fit this list or that list or three out of five of these different uh, kind of possibilities, then you're, you're put in a category. It's really absurd, really absurd. Uh, and and it, mm. in the process, it loses sight of the richness of experience that each of us bring to the to the clinic. Each of us bring to the encounter with the with the practitioner. Mm -hmm. So, w what would you say to someone? Um, and maybe this question can lead us to uh, what libera or liberation psychology can offer. But um, what would you say to someone who has been to a psychiatrist? They've been told that they have depression uh, because they have a, a, a chemical imbalance in their brains, um, and that this category would help them. What would you say to a person like that in terms of um, you know a, a better way to understand themselves or more or liberating way? Well, first thing I would say is that if this label helps you to make sense of your experience, then that's fine. Then work with that and find a way of giving your own meaning to that label that you've been given so that you work within the label and you make it something that's useful for you rather than something that's just handed from professional to professional. So in that way, you can start to take control of your own life. The other thing is to look, and of course now we have the internet, things are easier, uh, to look uh, for the different experiences that people have of the treatments that are given for this particular label, and to think about which one's you really think you want to try and which alternatives uh, there are. So I, I, what, I would, what I would always ask when someone comes into the clinic and they say, I'm depressed or uh, I have some other kind of label, I would say, well, where did you hear that? Where did you first hear that? And to think about how that label was given to you, and then to think about how useful it is, and to think about when it works and when it doesn't work, and to open up the space for you to do something different with it. <laughs> then you could choose to drop it altogether. Uh, uh, but that's, I think that's up to, up to you, really. Hmm. It seems like a, a lot of the... Um... A lot of the dangers that uh, this classification system brings can be bypassed if we think about these uh, labels in terms of their usefulness rather than um, as absolute truth about who we are. Yes, that's right. Um, th these labels you can treat as little games, little language games. Mm -hmm. And you can play this game yourself and you can feel more powerful if you're playing the game and you know what you're doing. It's when you don't know what is happening to you and you don't know what it means and you don't know what's going to be given to you that things start to be frightening and you uh, can then go into, uh, into, into a worse place as a result of it and, and feel helpless. That's the real danger with these labels, that they become the property of the experts and you have no control over how they're used. Treat it as a game and learn how to play the game. <laughs> Great. Yeah, there's, there's something inherently uh, empowering in that message. Um, and, and very, it seems like you put the uh, evaluative process in the hands of the, the person who, who is using that label because um, ultimately they, they, it sounds like their experience becomes the, the arbiter of, of whether this label is doing what it ought to do or not. Yes, that's right. That's that's exactly it. Yes. Okay. Great. So, is is this linked uh, to liberation psychology? What uh, what is liberation psychology for those listening, and and what can it offer them? Well, when we were developing critical psychology, 
uh, we learned from experiences of people doing radical work from around the world. So we did learn a lot from South Africa uh, when we visited um, in the 1990s and through the 2000s. Uh, but we also learned uh, from the experiences of radical psychologists in Latin America. And that's where liberation psychology started to develop. There was a movement that developed in Latin America, particularly in Brazil, called liberation theology. And this was uh, uh, priests uh, and church workers who were taking the theological arguments in the church and saying, well, we need, instead of treating these ideas as ideas that tell us how we must behave, how we must always be the same, Let's find a way of questioning these ideas and using these ideas and thinking about how they can be empowering to us. And so that movement became known as liberation theology. A phrase that was used in the church was that liberation theology had a preferential option for the poor. That is, it prioritized poor people. It prioritized the experience of the oppressed. And so liberation theology became a kind of model for psychologists to turn around and question their own discipline of psychology. And so they developed the idea of liberation psychology. Liberation psychology works in the poor communities and is dedicated to empowering people, helping people to think for themselves and to act collectively. Now, I should say that not all the liberation psychologists are interested in psychoanalysis, and that's fine. Uh, although I do work as a psychoanalyst, I'm not an evangelist for psychoanalysis. And I think there are lots of different ways that people can reflect on their experience and empower themselves with others in communities. But liberation psychology provides a kind of broad kind of research approach that always works with communities and works with the questions that communities develop for themselves instead of coming from the outside with stupid questions that we've developed in the psychology department. So we work with the people with their own concerns, and that's where we that's where we start. That's what liberation psychology is. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. Now that that sounds um, there, there's something very uh, collectivistic um, about that, uh, and 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 also it seems to start with this seems so obvious, you know, but it seems to start with the concerns of the the group and the community which um seems it seems very obvious but you know i guess that doesn't always happen well it it it, it that's the funny thing you know <laughs> it is obvious but um i mean you'll know from being a psychology student and i remember it very well myself that when i started to study psychology as a student we were told to forget common sense and to forget things that made immediate sense and to say, no, 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 you need to be mm. suspicious of what people say to you. You need mm. to work with these theories and these theories will tell you how people are thinking. Then you must not work on your own experience. No, don't talk about yourself. Mm. Just talk about other people as if they're objects and do things to them. And so we need to be able to work our way through this if we're going to do anything critical in psychology and to find our way back to listening to people again and developing different kinds of theories that are that are more useful for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I really believe that that suspicion uh, that we have espoused has, has seeped into the public attitude it, it's almost like there's been this process of um, you know uh, treating uh, people as children and and in that like taking away uh, 
um, that power from from their ability to trust the experience, trust the fact that they have an ability to uh, change and to to uh, get together and form their own support groups. It, it almost feels like an infantilizing process. Yes, that's right. Um, um, and well, it, it 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 there are two problems. One is that it infantilizes people and tells them not to believe what they already know. And the other is that it kind of builds up a kind of network which itself is built on common sense as it is at the moment, with all of the problems of common sense, because there are a lot of aspects of common sense that are problematic as well. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's a false solution to turn to psychology to help you disconnect yourself from dominant forms of the common sense. If you really want to develop something new and empowering, you need to work with people in their everyday practice, challenging oppression. And it's on that basis that you'll be able to challenge taken for granted ideas that, that are given to you, uh, that tell you how to live. Hmm. Great. Um, Professor Parker, I, I'd like to ask you um, to direct people to your work and, and where they can find out a bit more about what you do. But uh, before that, I'd like to ask if you have um, any any closing message for someone who's listening to this and, and uh, they're playing around with these ideas that you've offered up um, and they'd, they'd like to, to help themselves. Um, I, know, I know a lot of what you speak about is needing to understand the specifics of the situation, but is there is there any sort of... Uh, generic uh, closing statement you would you would give our listeners. Uh, yes, uh, don't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe that's enough. <laughs> great. Yeah. That's, you know, uh, you, uh, you... Marx, the great, the great uh, uh, social activist, political activist Karl Marx. One of his favorite phrases was "Doubt everything." And I think that that's a good place to start. <laughs> Great. You, you certainly practice what you preach. So thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time. Where can people uh, find out more about you and your work? Uh, well, one place is in the research group that we set up um, nearly 30 years ago called the Discourse Unit. If you just look at discourseunit.com, You'll find the journal, the Annual Review of Critical Psychology, which has lots of ideas, including psychoanalysis and feminism and Marxism and post-colonial theory, and other kinds of ideas around critical psychology. Um, the other place to look is a magazine called Asylum. Asylum Magazine is a magazine for radical mental health that's been going for many, many years that I've been involved with uh, for some time. And that has lots of very interesting articles about uh, different experiences that people have in the psychiatric system as patients in psychotherapy and, and finding alternative collective ways of making sense of those experiences. So if you look at the discourse unit, you will find a link to Asylum magazine. So maybe start with discourseunit.com. Okay, perfect. Uh, Professor Parker, thank you so much for being here and thank you for sharing your time. And I, I hope none uh, my audience don't listen to you today. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Great. <laughs>